Test, 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 test. Okay. All right, let's get started. Welcome back. I hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving, ate lots of turkey, and did no homework. That is the point of it. The quiz is still posted and will be posted until Wednesday afternoon. So if you haven't written it yet, please get that out of the way. The assignment for this week is up and has been since Friday. Today's lecture should fully kind of go through what you need to do and give you all of the sort of techniques you need if you haven't already done it. If it hasn't become clear by now, I just wanted to officially say it because I'm getting some odd questions once in a while. The lectures are not everything. We're going through the material, we're giving you the high level perspective, we're showing you what the definitions are and how the statistics work. When it comes to the homework, you should expect to do the homework with your textbook beside you and open. The textbook goes into more detail and does more problems. And everything that we do is taken so that it can be done given what the textbook has done. So if you don't understand it, rather than instantly going, what, where the lecture was that, think, Maybe this is something that's actually in the book and they only covered it very cursorily in the lecture. All right? So, so the expectation here is that you are going to do some reading on your own as part of your homework time. And that's what it's supposed to be there for is to force you to go, all right, how do I actually do this? Some of it was in the lecture, but some of it might not have been. Let's read through the book and see what I can find. And we're trying to cover no more than 15 or 20 pages per lecture. So there's really not that much there to cover. It's just the stuff from that week's lecture. And just because of the timing and the way the lectures work out, you are always at a slight disadvantage because you don't have your lecture until Tuesday of the sequence where the assignment is due Friday to Friday. So if you want to read ahead, it will let you do work on the weekend ahead of the lecture actually being posted. That's about it. Uh, no other announcements. Your workshops, if you haven't gone to them, there's the workshop tomorrow. But then on Thursday, we're back to the regular schedule. Attend your workshop, quiz at the end, that sort of thing. And we're getting into a little bit more math content in the sense that there's actually formulas now. So not very many. Admittedly, there's one formula so far. But we are getting formulas, which means you got to dust off that grade 11, grade 12 math, whatever it was you took last, and actually remember how to manipulate two, two unknowns in a single equation. All right, lecture number five, the central limit theorem. We are on chapter 2.5 of the text. Today covers chapters 2.5 and most of 2.6. 2.5 is quite short. We're, we're now getting into the sort of core topic, which is how we go about analyzing statistics. And remember what a statistic is. A statistic is a function of data. So we take numbers, data points that we've gathered, and we apply a function to those, the resulting output is called a statistic. And we've seen a couple of these so far. We've taken the average of numbers and the median of numbers. Those are both statistics. So the central limit theorem applies to what happens when you do statistics on a bunch of data a bunch of times. These are the four examples, three of which in the text and three of which we've seen. So this was the opportunity cost DVD problem that we looked at. This was CPR. This was the tapper's example that we finished last lecture with. Remember, you tap out the thing, and you try and have the person listening tell what, what song or tune that is. And then this, this was one that we didn't do, which was a medical consultant, which I had you look at in this workshop this past week. So these are four examples. And in all four examples, when you plot the histogram of enough points, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 points, the histograms all start to look the same. Everybody see that? You look at these, you say, okay, if I was going to draw a curve to fit all of these, depending on how artistic you are, you start drawing these and you realize they all basically look the same. They are hump-shaped. They all have a center and they're symmetric about those centers. Sorry, one moment. Apparently, the panopto is showing something completely different. Mark wants me to fix it, so just give me a moment.
So supposedly fixed. I did nothing. These are all the same shape. They're all hump shaped. They all have the same idea that they're symmetric about a center. They all decay to the left, decay to the right. Now, what's different about them is that aside from their centers being at slightly different spots, notice that this one's around 0 0.52 maybe, or 0 0.5. This one's around 0 0.10. This is 0, and this is 0. They're located with different centers, but also different spreads different distances that they go out to make these tails as they move to the left and the right. This one goes from 0 down to negative 0 0.3 and positive. This one maybe goes a little bit further, has a little bit more spread. This one's centered at 0.5, not at 0, and goes down to 0.35 and 0.65. So you see, while they look like the same shape, they're not identical. But they all share similar characteristics. So all of the distributions share similar characteristics in that they are symmetric, they are shaped like a bell, they may not be centered at the same point, they may not have the same curvature or decay, but otherwise they look the same. And when we see something like that happening in mathematics, of which statistics is a subfield, it usually means that they are members of a common family. For example, you all took some level of high school math Remember that when you look at polynomials, quadratics, they all have common shapes. They're either concave up or concave down. And they always look, otherwise you can tell it's a quadratic. Cubics on the same token kind of come up and then go up again or come down and then come down again. Exponentials and so on. So these look the same, which implies to us they're probably members of the same function family. And this is what leads to the central limit theorem. So the central limit theorem says if we look at a proportion, and all of the examples we've looked at so far have been proportions, then under certain conditions, the sample proportion, which is our estimated thing. So sample proportion here, remember what that means. Sample proportion, this means p hat, our guess. Our take the data, plug it in, get a number, guess. That quantity will follow a bell-shaped curve called the normal distribution. And in statistics, distribution is the same as function family. So for math, this is a function family. This is called the central limit theorem often short formed as CLT because we're just as lazy as any mathematicians. If you can use an acronym, we will. So this is the central limit theorem. The conditions required for the central limit theorem are twofold. One, you must have independent samples. And two, the sample must be large enough. Now, what do these mean? The first condition required is independence. And to have observations in a sample be independent, we can take a random sample from a population, and that will suffice. Or we can take a given set of users or patients or something and randomly assign them control treatment. Control treatment, like we did in all the examples we've done so far. In either of those cases, we've integrated the concept of randomness. And that is what is required to say that samples are independent. Now, that is about as clear as mud, but that's what we need. We need the samples to be independent. And in a full-fledged honors class in statistics, we would now spend three weeks talking about conditions to make this true and all that kind of stuff. For you, you just kind of go, most of the time, things are going to be independent. And if they're not, we're going to set up the problem so that you have the chance to answer a question about independence before you proceed to trigger your mind to go, oh, maybe I need to check this. Let's look at a couple of specific examples. So observations in a sample are independent when the outcome of one of these observations has no effect and gives no information about any of the other samples in the set. That's what it means to be independent. Just like, you know, to be an independent person means you're not dependent upon someone else. To be an independent sample 
means it's not dependent on another sample or on information that the other samples may give. So let's try some examples here. What if I take a coin and I flip it? And I then follow that up and flip it again. Is that pair of observations independent? Does flipping the coin once give me any information about the second flip of the coin? No. So these are independent. What about a deck of cards, 52 cards? I pull a card out of the deck and go, this is your card. I'm doing a magic trick. I put it back in the deck. I shuffle the deck and I pull out another card. Are those two cards independent? What do you think? Yes, because the probability of pulling out a specific card from that deck is the same in both cases because I took the card and I put it back. So I'm drawing from the same pool of observation. So that one's independent as well. All right. Pick a card, any card, put it down on the table, pick a second card. Are those independent? So why are those not independent? I pulled a card out of the deck. What's left is now 51 cards. And the probabilities of pulling one of the remaining cards is now different than it was in the first step. So what I've pulled out actually informs my probabilities for phase two. Because if I pulled out the ace of clubs, I now know the probability of getting another ace of clubs is zero. Because I pulled it out already. So these are not independent. Pick a family at random. I pick one of you and I say, okay, I'm going to talk about your family. And I find your mother and your father, and I ask them, what did you have for dinner? <coughs> Are the answers that they give independent? No, because families, not always, but mostly, tend to eat together. And whatever the wife eats, the husband eats, because one of them made it and put it on the table, and if you don't like that, then, well, you're going to starve for supper. So these are not independent, because once you know one, you have a very high probability of knowing the second. Now, you know, it easily could be that one of them was out for a work supper or was home late and just grabbed something from the fridge. But high probability, the two of them ate the same meal, which means you know what they had to eat once you ask one of them, not both of them. Final one. I take a twin. I measure their blood pressure. I then take their twin, the second twin, and I measure the blood pressure again. Independent or dependent? What do you think? What determines your blood pressure? Lifestyle. Lifestyle is definitely one thing, yes. Cholesterol count, all these sort of things. What else? Genetics. Genetics. Twins. And I'm, I'm assuming here, I'm going to say these are identical twins, not fraternal twins. But nonetheless, twins have the same genetics which means they have the same base physiology. So regardless of whether one's an athlete, the other one's a couch potato, they start from the same baseline, which means knowing one gives you information about the other. Not the exact blood pressure, mind you, but enough information that they're no longer independent. So these aren't independent. That's the general idea. So when you are dealing with samples, just always second guess it and go, okay, did I observe these independently? Does knowing one thing give me information about the others? Or does knowing what this person said then inform me about what everybody else might have said? Or are they truly independent? The central limit theorem only applies if they are independent samples. And at some point in the next couple of weeks, I will put a problem on a quiz or an assignment that's going to ask you to distinguish between those two things, just as a good practice. Even then, if you're only fraternal twins, you still share all the genetics from your mom and your dad. And families tend to have clusters of health things because you are, you are a mix of your mother and your father. 
50-50. And so what their blood pressure is and their lifestyle tends to inform what yours is. So there would still be enough information there that it wouldn't be. Now, if I said, I'm going to pick you completely at random, and then that person, and I measured your blood pressures, those are independent. Because you have nothing to do with one another. You're just random people in a classroom. The only thing you share in common is that your ages are within a couple of years, probably. Other than that, there's, you come from different cities, you come from different families, different cultures, all kinds of things. So it would be independent. But there's no randomness. When I say twin A, twin B, blood pressure one, blood pressure two, they're very clearly closely related. And so those two have some knowledge or some information about each other. Could you determine what that is? Probably not. But we can tell that it's there, which means we have to just be careful. All right? So how do we achieve independence when we're trying to take samples from a population? One option, take a random sample from a population. What we've been doing all along. If you do that, that gives you independence, assumed independence. If we are performing an experiment where we have a pool of patients or guinea pigs or whatever, then in that case, we need to randomize the assignment of which one you're in, and then we are allowed to talk about independence. So the common feature here is the idea of randomness. If you have randomness, then you get independence. So as long as we have randomness, everything's okay. The second requirement, remember there were two requirements for the central limit theorem to apply. The second requirement is large samples. The idea being you need to have enough data points for the whatever distribution you're dealing with to start approximating a normal distribution. Unfortunately, there's no hard, fast, universal rule for this. There's no, you need 12 samples and then you're good kind of thing. It varies from problem to problem and type of experiment to type of experiment, how many you need. And if you read any other book, any other stats book, they will often start introducing, every time they do one, they'll introduce another new rule for how you determine whether the central limit theorem applies. And it gets very confusing keeping track of all of it. So for now, we're not even going to talk about those guidelines, but in chapter three, we'll start talking about how many samples you need in order to be able to say, yes, we have enough samples that this is independent. And the, this book I like because it tries to generalize that rule to a way that it'll work for more than one distribution so you don't have as many rules to memorize. But for now, you can just sort of assume that it's going to work until we get to chapter three and start showing you where it can break. All right. Now, I glossed right over the normal distribution function family bit of that definition. Now we're in chapter 2.6. And we're going to talk about exactly what this thing is. So, this is a unimodal and symmetric bell-shaped curve. So anytime you see something that looks like this, that is unimodal, this is the mode. Talked about that back in chapter one. It's symmetric, there's the symmetry, and it's shaped like a bell, sort of. I've never really understood bell-shaped. It doesn't really look like many bells I've seen. I guess it's because it flares out at the bottom. So. so, many variables are nearly normal, none are exactly normal. The problem is that to have a truly normal random variable is kind of this made up thing. It doesn't really exist in nature, but we can approximate it with arbitrary precision. To have a truly normal random variable is very arbitrary, but to have one that approximates a normal happens all the time, and that's what we're kind of using this for. So we denote these things as a script n with a mu and a sigma parameter. That's what these are called. And so if you were doing, so think about this as a function. What do you need to know to uniquely identify a quadratic? Remember a quadratic's from high school. You know, it's ax squared plus bx plus c. What do you need to uniquely describe that to another person? So if we had a quadratic, which was ax squared plus bx plus c equals y, 
what would we need to pass on to someone else for them to know exactly which quadratic we're talking about? The ABC values. You have to give them everything. Is it enough to give someone a couple of points on that curve? If I give you two points on a quadratic curve, is that enough? Why not? What's wrong with me just giving you two points and saying, fit the unique quadratic that goes through those two points? The problem is, if I give you two points, which quadratic do I draw? Do I draw the one that looks like that? Or do I draw the one that looks like that? You don't know. Those two points are not enough to uniquely parameterize a quadratic. And if you did high school calculus, you may have actually seen these techniques before for parameterization of functions. But if not, it's, it's really not a big deal. But what, it, what I want you to take from this is this is what you need to pass on to uniquely describe a quadratic to another person. These are what we need to pass on to uniquely describe a normal to another person. And these are called parameters. So if I give you mu and sigma, and this assignment that you have right now is just all 10 questions are, here's a mu, here's a sigma. Once you have that, you know which unique thing you're dealing with, and you can then proceed to do the analysis. So these are called parameters, and they are the mean and the standard deviation. And the mean sits right here at the center of the distribution, and then the standard deviation is a measure of how wide it is, although there's some subtleties there we still need to talk about. So I basically tell you where it's centered and how spread out it is, and then you, you know which normal you're dealing with. So let's take a look at a fun example. You, are you all familiar with OkCupid? Vaguely, I'm not saying you necessarily used it, but you're familiar with it. It's, it's a dating site, a website that is, is designed to allow people to find partners for dating. So when you fill these things out, as I'm sure you're all aware, it's like any profile for any social media oriented site. You put in your personal details. You put in a picture that flatters you as much as possible. You put in your height and weight as much to flatter yourself as possible. So this curve right here in the background is the known distribution of heights for adult males in the United States. The dotted line which goes through here is the reported heights on OkCupid. And it, they basically are an inch higher all the way along until you get to 5'10", and then magically, everybody who should be 5'10", or most of them, are magically six feet tall. And the people who are 5'11", oh, they're six feet too. And then the people who are 6'1", are 6'1", and everything goes back to normal. What's going on? They're lying through their teeth. How tall are you? Oh, I'm six feet tall. No, you're not. You're 5'10". Close enough, right? You know, everybody wants to add a little bit of height, make themselves a little taller, make themselves a little handsomer in there. So it's roughly the same right up to 5'8". And then once you hit 5'8", everybody starts cheating. I'm 5'8 and a half. 5'8 and, you know, 9 tenths of an inch. I'm 5'9". I'm 5'10". I'm 5'11". I'm six feet tall. So vanity is playing a role here, and people are lying on the internet. I know, shock, right? <laughs> so this is men. We all laugh about it. Ha ha, men are so vain. Yeah, women do the same thing. So here's the, the female heights in the United States. You'll notice that the center of female heights in the United States is somewhere between 5'2 and 5'4. That's about normal. That's what we expect, right? You know, think about your friend group. How many friends do you have, female friends, who are six feet tall? One, maybe two. If you're on the volleyball team, maybe six, you know? But like, women above six feet is pretty rare in North America. 
Women below 4'10 in North America is pretty rare. And you can see that in the way the shape of the distribution behaves. Once we're down here under 5 feet, we don't have that much left. But women on OkCupid magically add an inch to their height. And I mean, if they go on a date in heels, it's hard to tell anyway. And they lie as well. So women lie on the internet just as much as men. But we know what the distribution is because we have surveys and we have medical files. We can actually tell what the average height in the United States is. And so we know they're lying because we scrape all these profiles, we put it together like either short people don't date or these people are lying. And which one of those is more probable? So just as a reminder, though, these central limits and the things that look like normal in statistics class, unless you are told that a variable is normal, it doesn't follow the central limit theorem. The central limit theorem applies to statistics. So just remember that. It has to apply to something which is computed on data. So it won't just be a sample. So if I took all of your heights, to, to use this example again, and I measured how tall you all are, the individual samples from that are not normal. But if I took the average of all of the heights in the room, that follows the central limit theorem. That is distributed normally. So it's very important you distinguish between that. There's one question on the assignment that just asked you that question. It's a, it's a pick one of these four, which one of these follows the central limit theorem, and you just have to go, it's the one that has the statistic in it. And just as a reminder, average, which we've looked at before, was defined to be x bar. That was the way we denoted it, which was x1 plus x2 plus xn divided by n. So when we, whenever you see X bar in this class, it means the average of the numbers that you had. All right. So different parameters, different shapes. Here are two normal distributions. So we have normal distribution centered at zero with standard deviation plus or minus one, which covers most of the center hump of the curve. Or we have centered at 19 with standard deviation plus or minus four. Again, covering most of the middle of the curve. If you plotted these on the same scale, notice how these scales are wildly different. If you plotted these on the same scale, this is what it looks like. And you can see that they look very different, but they're both unimodal, they're both symmetric, they're both normal. They're just different versions of the normal. Do we understand the distinction there? Just like you can have two quadratics that are shaped differently, you can have two normal distributions that are shaped differently. All right, everybody familiar with the SAT? You've heard of it before? Some of you may even have even written it before you came to university if you're thinking about going to the US or if you're from the US. If so, welcome to Canada. So SAT scores are distributed almost normally by design. They build it that way. It's supposed to be distributed normally. The mean of the SAT, so the average score, half the class, you know, the graduating class, should get a score above 1,500. Half the class should get a score below 1,500. That's how they're designed. The standard deviation is designed to be 300 points. So this tells us that we have a normal centered at 1,500 with standard deviation 300. ACT is a, another you know, advanced collegiate test. I think that's what it's called. And they are also distributed normally, but this one is centered on 21 with standard deviation 5. So Pam, who got 1,800 on her SAT, and Jim, who got a 24 on his ACT, both apply to the same university. And the admissions officer wants to be able to distinguish between these two candidates to figure out who did better on their standardized test because otherwise their files are exactly the same. So the one who did better on the standardized test gets in and the one who doesn't does not. But she needs to compare numbers of 1,800 and 24. 
And you can't just say 1,800 is bigger than 24 because then everybody who wrote their name on the SAT does better than all of the ACT writers because you get 300 points for putting your name at the top. It's, not, it's designed that everybody does better than 900 points. If you get under 900 on your SAT, you don't go to university or college or anything really. So, you know, it's designed with standard deviation of 300. It's designed that two standard deviations below the mean that's like the cutoff for you don't belong in tertiary education. You actually aren't good at doing school. So find a job where you don't have to do brain things. So we want to compare these. So how would you compare these? We have two wildly different numbers from wildly different scales, but those scales are both normal. So we can compare them because we can standardize both of them. And that's what we're going to do. We want to compare how many standard deviations above the mean each one is within its own distribution. So if we take Pam, she was 1,800 minus 1,500. How far above the mean was she? She was 300 points. And that is, divided by 300, one standard deviation above the mean. Whereas Jim was 24 points. His mean was 21, so he was three points above the mean, and one standard deviation above the mean should be five points in an ACT. So Jim was only 0.6 standard deviations above the mean. So if we put this on a standard scale where the mean is at zero and the standard deviation is one, and we convert both of them into a number based on that assumption, then we see that Pam did better on her SAT than Jim did on his ACT. Because Pam scored a higher relative score on her test than Jim did on his. And you, could, you can imagine this applying in, uh, in a split class. So when you get to fourth year, often the fourth year courses at, here at Trent and, and everywhere really much can be taught as a split class. So it's taught for fourth year senior students and, and master students as well. And so we have the same course, same lectures, often different tests. And so what will happen is the graduate test will be out of more marks and we'll have more questions. Some of the questions will be shared, but there'll be extra stuff. So if you wanted to share, to, to describe relative performance between the two, they're out of different numbers. So you have to be able to standardize to be able to compare them on the same scale. And we do that on tests by just saying, what percent did you get? Oh, you got a 92? That's pretty good. And that's a percent, and then we just compare the percentages. But on this test, because we didn't have percentages, we had to do this standardization. So this leads to our formula. This is a Z score formula. This is the essence of almost every question on this assignment. And what you do is you take your observed value you subtract the mean of the distribution, and then you divide that result. Notice that there are brackets here. They are very important by the standard deviation. Do not take observation minus mean over SD or observation over SD minus mean. It's take the difference of the two, then divide that number by the standard deviation value. This is known as a Z score, a standardized score, or just a Z. And for the purposes of this class, we will never use Z for anything else. This is the unique use of the variable Z in this class. So if you see a Z, it means this slide. And you're expected to know that and use that for the rest of the term. So you can do a z-score for any distribution you want. You can do it for a normal, you can do it for a binomial, a Poisson, there's all these families of statistical distributions that you'll learn about over the next eight months. But it only really makes sense for comparison purposes if both of the inputs are normal. And if they're both normal, then this gives us a way to compute percentiles. So observations, this is kind of an aside. Anything more than two standard deviations above the mean, that means a z-score that is either bigger than positive two or smaller than negative two, way out in the tails, those are considered to be extreme values. 
and you consider those to be unusual. So for example, in the height, let's just jump back up a couple of slides, take a look at women on the OKCupid. Okay so here, you'll notice how these distributions kind of behave. Here's the middle of the dot, here's one, here's two. This says that anybody up there, 5'11", 6 foot, 6 foot 1, as a female in North America, is considered an extreme or large, larger than the norm, right? And that's true. You know, when, I, when, I, when you think about it, how many six feet or higher women do you actually know in your life? One or two? And how many women do you know in your life? Dozens, hundreds, right? They're unusual because their genetics have given them a lot more height than we would expect by average. So that's a Z score. So the rest of today's lecture and your, your next assignment that's due Friday is all about this set score, variations of the set score. So what is a percentile? We kind of talked about that a little bit past weeks, but a percentile is a per cent, that is out of 100, quantile. So we did Q1, Q2, and Q3 in past weeks for the 25th, 50th, and 75th percentiles. We defined them that way, but we didn't talk about any other percentiles. So here, we're actually going to genuinely get to define these for the normal. So a percentile, so the 50th percentile, the 75th percentile, the whatever, is the area that falls under the probability curve to the left of the quantity that you've chosen. So it is this the shaded area, and that, in the case of our normal distribution here, this is plus one standard deviation above the mean, and we can actually compute exactly the size of that area using R or a table of values. And almost every question on the assignment is actually asking you to do that over and over and over again. These are probabilities too, so they can be interpreted as probabilities. So this would be this area here, we'll talk more about this in a minute, the probability that a variable x, which is normally distributed, in other words, your score being less than 1,800. Also, if you want, you can write it as less than or equal to 1,800, and it makes no difference at all. For anybody who did calculus, who knows what an integral is, and there's only a few of you because it's not required, for most programs, but you know, some of you took high school calculus. The integral of this shape from minus infinity up to 1800 is equal to this. And integrals don't care if you include the last point or not. And so that's why they are exactly the same. So anytime you see a probability statement like this in your course, it doesn't matter whether it's less than or equal to or less than, it's the same quantity. Question. It's, it's not ever something you memorize explicitly. Uh, there is a rule of thumb we're going to talk about at the last 10 or so minutes of the class, which says that if you are plus or minus one standard deviation, it's approximately this much. But, but we'll actually see the exact numbers, and I'll show you how to find them so you can look them up. So there are many ways to compute these. Number one is use R. And this is one of the nicest things that we get to do in this course. We get to get rid of a massive week-long discussion of how to look up values in tables because it's 1946. No, you're going to use a computer. That's what they're for. Because honestly, I learned how to look up these values in tables back in 2001, and I have done it zero times since. Why would I when I have computers? They're faster. And I'd have to find the tables because they're in the back of some book somewhere. So they're, they are in the back of this book, and I think they should actually just drop them completely. But we're not going to bother except to show you vaguely what they look like. In case somebody's like, what's a table? You're like, I know what those look like. Never used them, but I know what they look like. This is P norm. This computes the probability of a random variable that is normally distributed being less than this. This is the cutoff. And these are the parameters. Is 
sorry, there's a fly that just will not leave me alone. So that last slide, which had that area shaded in, and 1800 was the cutoff, and we knew it was the SAT scores, so it was centered at 1500 and had standard deviation of 300. If we tell R to do a P norm of those three numbers, it will give us the exact area under that curve, which is actually the exact probability of an SAT score being smaller than 1800. And if you do it, it'll be somewhere in the high 60%. There are applets on the internet that will do this for you, Java applets, JavaScript applets, all kinds of things. You can do that, but you have R. Just use R. It's easy. And the one time I'm going to show you how to do this, and I do not expect you to memorize this or learn how to do this or do this on a test, but if you really want to learn, you can. What we do is we take the Z number that you want, the standardized number. So in this case, it would be 1,800 minus 1,500 divided by 300, which is 1.0. And you find the leading decimal here and the second decimal there. So this is 1.00, so 1.00. And you find the intersection between those two, and it gives you the number. So I was off of 84%, not 69%. So this is actually the answer, 8413. And if we go back up, this would be 8413, which it is. And this is therefore 8413. So that's the area under that curve. Okay, that's how we do it. We're going to come back to that idea. I'm going to do a few more. But first, let's kind of talk about where you might use this. Why do you care? Is anybody familiar with Six Sigma? Anybody heard of it? Two, maybe three people? Uh, if your parents work in any sort of tech, uh, like uh, technology-based or in particular manufacturing-based kind of employment, they'll be familiar with it. It is a corporate thing. It's a corporate standard that you meet where you try and... Make sure that the process you're designing will fall out of the expected bounds no fewer, or sorry, no more than one in Six Sigma times. And Six Sigma is basically saying, way, way out in the tails, we want our process to be in that center hump. And there are consultants who are happy to charge you tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars to help you achieve Six Sigma rating on your process control. And about half of it is basically bunk, and the other half was actual genuine science developed to try and help process control be more precise. And you say process control, what's that? It's anything. Every single thing you have in your possession right now went through a process control. Your clothes, your coffee mugs, your Tim Hortons cup, your cell phone, the chips in the cell phone, the laptops, the chips in the laptop, your hairband. Your glasses, they all went through a process because they were all manufactured. And so most companies try and follow some variation of this thing, which is to say they try and set up their quality control on their factory line that makes glasses frames or laptops or whatever so that you get a defective product no more than one in sort of six sigma variations. It makes it very, very rare. It's like one in 10 million should be bad here. So here's an example of just this. You know, you've all had ketchup before, I assume. Probably Heinz ketchup. They kind of dominate the market, unless you go cheapo at the Walmart store brand, you know. But Heinz ketchup, it's, it's a company. So at their factory, they want the bottles of ketchup to be 36 ounces. That's what they say on the label. This is a 36 ounce bottle of ketchup with no more than some variation. Because obviously, not every single bottle of ketchup weighs exactly 36 ounces right on the dot, because that's way too hard. And that bottle was filled by a robot. So, you know, there's a certain amount of viscosity to ketchup. Maybe a little extra drop fell in, and you weigh 36.01 ounces. Or maybe it cut off the flow a little bit too early, and it was 29 point, sorry, 35.9 ounces. Obviously, if you get your ketchup bottle and you bring it home and you put it on a very accurate scale, it may not be exactly 36 ounces of ketchup. So, 
how much is acceptable. How much variation are they allowed to have before you start to get people filing class action lawsuits because they only got 35 ounces of ketchup in their ketchup bottle. And they paid for 36, damn it, and they want all 36. People have done stupider things. So companies worry about this kind of thing, and that's what they're after. So they want the amounts that go in to be normally distributed around 36 with standard deviation 0.11 ounce. So once every 30 minutes, a guy in a lab coat comes up and grabs a random bottle off the line, takes it back to his station, and he weighs how much the bottle and the ketchup is together, and then he empties it all out, and he weighs how much the bottle is empty, and he gets exactly how much ketchup ended up in that bottle. So if the amount of the ketchup in the bottle is below 35.8 or above 36.2, then we will reject that bottle. We'll say that failed quality control. And what they're aiming for is a low number of bottles that fail, which lets them know that, in fact, most of the bottles leaving the factory are 36 ounces like they're supposed to be. So what percent of bottles would then fail? So we say, well, it's supposed to be mean of 36 and standard deviation of 11, 0.11. So we take our 35.8 and a minus 36 to figure out the difference Divide by 0.11, it's 1.82. And so this is 1.82 negative on the standardized scale. What percent of the time is this? This is where we have to compute something. So now we have a Z. And we want to compute the probability that Z is less than or equal to negative 1.82 which is the same as the probability of x being less than or equal to 35.8. They're both exactly the same quantities, just one uses the full normal distribution, the other one uses the standardized normal distribution. It's entirely up to you which way you go. If you do not specify the mean and the standard deviation in R, it defaults to 0 and 1, the standard one, and it assumes you're giving it z's instead of x's. If you specify, then it knows you're giving you an x. So, we could use the Z table to do it. So we know that this is negative 1.82. And so you could go negative 1.82. There you go. And you could find it. Or in the time it took you to find that table, you could do this. So again, the defaults are mean equals 0 and SD equal 1. And if you don't specify the mean and the standard deviation in the function call, it'll just fill them in for you as 0 and 1. So if you just say P norm of a number, it goes, oh, that's a Z. Gotcha. Let me give you back the answer. You have to specify to change it to anything else. And so this is 0 0.0343795 or about 3.4%. 0 0.034. So go back up to the question. This asked, if the amount of the ketchup is below 35.8 or above 36.2, then it fails quality control. We just found the percent of the time that it failed quality control for being too small. But we did not find the other half being too big. So this is, if the ketchup is too low. What about too high? And you might say, well, what does it matter if it's too high? So long as the cap goes on the bottle, somebody gets a surprise and gets more ketchup. Yeah, but they're a corporation. If you start handing away free ketchup, right, left and center, before you know it, we'll be broke and on the street. You can't give more than 36.2 ounces or it's costing us X tens of thousands a year in free ketchup. And we don't like free things for corporations. So what about the too high? This is where you have to kind of think about this for a second. So this is our normal distribution. And I strongly encourage you for every single problem on the assignment, draw one of these. Just get in the habit of it and make sure your visualization in your head is actually matching up with what the problem is. This is a normal distribution. We know it's centered at 36. We know that this is a point here. I'll make it a little bit left. 
arbitrary point here and arbitrary point here. These are 36.2 and 35.8. And we computed this area here. What was that? 3.2% or 0 0.032. Thank you. How big is that? Why the same? You're right, but why? What are the two properties that are required to make a normal distribution? No, those, those are the parameters. What, what do all normal distributions share? They're all unimodal and symmetric. So you're absolutely right. It's because of the symmetry of the problem. They are the same shape. They are the same distance away from the mean. Now, if this was reject quality control, if this is 35.8 and 36.5, then they're no longer symmetric. And so you have to be very careful that you think about this. This is negative 0.2, and this is positive 0.2. So it is symmetric, and that means by symmetry, this is 3.4% as well. So you're absolutely right. But, but understanding why is important when you get to the more complicated problems because you've got to think your way through what's going on. So if I reject for being too small 3.4% of the time and I reject for being too big 3.4% of the time, what percent of the time will bottles actually pass the quality control? It's not this, it's not this, it's not this because it's actually asking about passing number four. And here's a full derivation of both sides. Now I want you to take a close look at this just to see because if it wasn't symmetric, this is what you would do. This is what you want. This is passing. So if it's bigger than 35.8, or smaller than 36.2, then that's when it passes quality control. So we draw the curve, we shade it in, and we go, that's what we want. That is actually equal to this shape here, which goes up to 36.2, but is filled all the way to the left, minus the stuff that fails because of too small, which is this. And both of those are set up in the way that R can compute them via p-norm. Because this is the p-norm of 1.82, and this is the p-norm of negative 1.82. And so you take those, and those give you the values 9656 and 0 0.0344, giving us 93%. This one slide is about half of your assignment. If you can do that, that's half the problems on this next assignment. I'm, gonna, I'm just making you do it over and over and over again until the idea sinks in. So it's a very focused assignment this week. Question? Yeah, I was just looking. Wouldn't you have question again? Question again, question again, question again, question question again, 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 question That's also given in the question. They were cutoffs. So you weren't just saying plus or minus a sigma reject. They're actually saying almost plus or minus two sigma reject, but they're just saying 0.11 for some reason that you just accept because it's part of the problem. But these gave us our cutoffs. And so the majority of the problems on the assignment are set up so they'll give you sigma, they'll give you mu, and then you have to go trot away and compute the probability of a quantity that's given. So you've now seen two variations. You've seen the probability between two numbers, the probability less than a number, and the probability less than a number. So we've seen two different methods. What if we wanted the probability of something being greater than a number? Does anyone see what you might be able to do with what you've seen so far? There's no new technique. It's just a different way of writing it down. I want the probability greater than a number. 
So I was able to do this between by starting with a bigger filled in thing and subtracting the pieces I didn't want. That's what you do for probability being bigger than a number. So if, I'll just do it up here, if I wanted probability that Z was greater than two, I could start with something that fills in more of the area, like say everything, and then subtract the stuff that's less than two. And that would be the same thing. So this in shape looks like this. So it's greater than two. And I could start with everything. And what is the area under one of these distribution curves? It's always exactly one. So this area would be one. And so I take one minus the P norm of two. And I would take the entire thing minus the stuff that is to the left of my cutoff, leaving behind the stuff that is to my right. Did that make sense? It's an important idea. We'll see a couple more examples, but it's an important idea. You have to get your head around that. Basically, everything adds up to one, and you can be clever with that to save yourself a lot of work. Sorry, how did you get the of, the, of this one up here? Oh, I, I'm using Zs. So it's always one. Oh, this one here? Yeah. 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 That point one one was given in the question about Heinz. So the question is, where did that point one one come from? The Heinz factory says our mean is 36 and our SD is 0.11. And they probably computed that by taking 1,000 random bottles and doing the long slog of figuring out what every single one was. And then they're like, OK, these bottles behave like this. They probably all behave like this. Let's go. Same robot, different day. OK, so that's one of the most important ideas in this section is the idea that you can subtract away from one to get the thing you want. And again, on this assignment, I have you doing this quite a few times, so think about it. Here's another example. Body temperature. I don't know if you know anyone. My wife runs cold all the time. Like, if it's below 26 degrees, she feels cold constantly, like fuzzy slippers now. It's 21 outside, and she's got her slippers out. Whereas I run hot. If it's, like, above 15, I'm good to go. Like you see my sleeves have been rolled up every single lecture because I overheat. Like, I run hot, she runs cold. So what if you were interested in that and went, you know, is this a real thing? Is this like psychosomatic or is this just, you know, what we're comfortable with? Do our bodies actually have variations in temperature? So we are told from physiological studies looking at tens of thousands of people that body temperatures of healthy humans are centered on 98.2 Fahrenheit with standard deviation 0.73. So this gives us our mean and our standard deviation. What would be the cutoff for the lowest 3% of people. So we want the cutoff on here so that this area is 0 0.03, the third percentile. Let me just write that out. That's going to confuse you. So what we can do is we say this is supposed to be 0 0.03. You could look it up in the table by working in reverse, but that's really annoying. Or we can convert it into Z and use the R function. So this is our Z conversion here. We want the area to the left less than 0 0.03. Or rather, sorry, less than some X, this is X, that equals 0 0.03. That means the probability that Z is less than negative 1.88 is equal to 0 0.03. How do I know it's 0 0.08? Sorry, 1.88. So this piece is take Z, which is going to be little x minus 98.2 over 0 0.73. And this would be equal to negative 1.88. That's that equation again. Therefore, x is equal to 96.8. This 1.88 could be taken from looking at the column and row on a table, but I strongly don't recommend that, or 
and this is what I want you to do. Q norm instead of P of 0 0.03. Let me show you a little more on the next slide. So just one sec. I need to insert a blank page. Nope, it's not working. Sorry. So the idea is this. If we have a Z score, we've computed a Z score, and we have that value, P norm tells us the area under the curve to the left. Q norm works in reverse. It says the area under the curve to the left is, therefore the Z must have been output. So if I say Q norm of 0 0.03, it says, oh, Okay, I've got a standard normal curve with an area of 0 0.03 underneath it. Therefore, the cutoff there had to have been negative 1.88. Your assignment can be done with two commands. Every question on the assignment can be either done without any comp computation at all or with P norm and Q norm combined. Those are all you need to do this assignment. So P norm takes the Z. and gives you an area, and Q norm takes the area and gives you a Z. So they did this work in reverse. And if you happen to have R open right now and you want to see that, take the Q norm of the output from P norm, and you should get back where you started. Let's take a look at, uh, so this worked out to be 96.8. So this means that 97% of the population has a resting body temperature above 96.8, and 3% of the population has a resting body temperature below 96.8. That I, it was right off the table, or do this in R. Either of those will work. And I expect you to do the QNR method. It's much faster and easier if you just get your head around it. So anybody who has R open, type QNORM of 0 0.03, and that's it and it should tell you negative 1.88. Yes? Yes, the area under the curve or the percentile that you want. And we'll see a few more examples as we move through, and we'll keep doing it. It's an important idea, that's it. Like th those two functions, that's your assignment this week. And your quiz next week is all just those two ideas. So if you can master that, you've done something well. All right. Here's another one. Same question, but different flex. So body temperatures are distributed normally, mean 98.2, standard deviation 0.73. What would be the cutoff for the people who run hot if you wanted the top 10%? So this is the top 10%, which is the same as saying what percentile? 90th percentile. Percentile is always measured from the left. First percentile, second percentile, 90th, 91st, 99th percentile, 100. You always count from the left from smallest to biggest. So the top 10 is like saying the 90th, the thing that is bigger than 90%. So this is the 90th percentile. So what command would I run to get the cutoff for the highest 10%, I'll run Q norm of 0 0.90, and that will give me a Z. A Z that corresponds to the standard normal distribution centered at zero, where this is 0 0.10. So this is Z question mark, and this will be equal to whatever Q norm spits out. So that'll tell me where it is. And then all I have to do is flip that back to a temperature by using the same equation we've used already, the Z score equation. So here's the work through. So this number here is actually 
8997 or almost 90% kind of worked out that way just by chance. Yes. So if you would like, so if you would like try to figure that out in the car, would you also do 0.10? No, no you wouldn't do 0.10 because that would be over here. Okay. You do Q norm. So this number here, it's 1.28. This will be Q norm of 0.90 because it's this line here and Q norm says area to the left is. And so that's why I've got this filled in 0.90. So this is 90% and if I ask Q norm it says, oh, that's 1.28, cool. But then you know that's also 10% is bigger, which gives you the same point because it's the same break point between the two. And a lot of these problems this week and working with this is this trick. It's draw a picture, figure out a breakpoint, and go which side is easier to work with. Because the area to the left, that's Q norm and P norm, and then you usually just subtract it from one. And now we take our equation, and this is our solution. So we have the Z score equation where we know the mean and we know the standard deviation but we don't know the x. But we do know what it's equal to because we found it from Q norm. How do you solve that equation for x? This is the extent of the math you're expected to do in this class. You'd be amazed. Some people just genuinely don't remember how to do this. You have to be able to solve this equation for x. How do you do it? We cross multiply. So we write x minus 98.2 is 1.28 times 0 0.73. And then you add 98.2 to both sides. You bring it around as well. And so x is equal to 98.2 plus 1.28 times 0 0.73, which works out to be 99.1 degrees Fahrenheit. And that was our answer. Take a good look at that. Can you do it on your own? You have to. That's the purpose of this week's assignment. You will be sitting there with some paper, working it out, and going to R and say, Q norm of this? OK. P norm of this? OK. And then you'll finish the problem, put in the answer, and so on. A bunch of the problems are literally just, what's P norm of this? Copy, paste into the cell, you're done. But some of them do require that you use this equation and you cross multiply and you solve for x. And there's no function in R to do that for you. You just have to do it yourself. All right, so the 68, this was your question, uh, 99 rule. So this is a rule of thumb. And it says, if you have normally distributed data, then 68% of it falls approximately within one standard deviation of the mean. See, this is plus or minus one standard deviation from the mean. 95% of it falls within two standard deviations of the mean. And 99.7% falls within three standard deviations of the mean. Question? Yes, it was. So remember earlier in the, in the class I said, two standard deviations away from the mean is considered to be an extreme value. That corresponds to 95% is not extreme, which corresponds, as he recognized, to an alpha of 0.05 for a hypothesis test. That's where it came from. So good eye to notice that. What's six sigma? Well, we'd have to go out another standard deviation for 4, another standard deviation for 5, and another standard deviation for 6. So if you're curious, you can compute this exactly. If you run, uh, what am I thinking? Yes, p norm of 6 times 2. We will get the tiny little area up here and the symmetric tiny little area down there. 
and that will be what percent of the time a process that is truly Six Sigma will fail. And it is a very, very small number. Many zeros and then a one. So if you're curious, you can try it out on your own. In R, just run P norm of six, and it will give you what this number is as a Z. And then you, it'll, and then, uh, sorry, well, the six is the Z. It'll give you the area under the curve from that Z back. So it would basically be the same as if I drew a normal distribution and I located the number six and the number negative six, and I said, what is the area between those two numbers? And you can compute that in R, and you would find it's very, very close to one. It's 99.99999. So how do we describe variability? Well, we use these as ballparks, and this is what they're meant to do. So remember the SAT scores. Mean of 1,500, standard deviation of 300. 68% of students who write the SAT therefore score between 1,200 and 1,800 on their SATs. 95% of students score between 900 and 2,100. And 99.7% score between 600 and 2,400. Does anyone know enough about the SAT to know why 2,400 is an important number? 2,400 on the SATs is a perfect score. So it's actually set up so that there is a little bit of failure to distinguish between people right up at the top end because actually you can't score higher than 2,400 on an SAT. That's a perfect score. So in actuality, this one is very much an approximation. It's really only about 99.5% of students score in there. Okay. Let's take a look at an example. How much do you sleep? We've talked about this before, but how much do you sleep versus how much do you really sleep? Oh, I get by on six hours a night. Do you? And how functional are you? Seven hours is the human norm. And we saw that graph earlier in the semester where lots of people need eight to function. So this was that graph. The mean of these numbers was 6.88 with a standard deviation of 0 0.93. So that puts us somewhere around here is our mean. And our standard deviation is around 0.1. Oh, sorry. That's not right. These are half hours. There's the mean. Plus or minus one. So we're out to about here and down to about here. And that is 68%. In actuality, this is real data. Remember, this is a ballpark. In actuality, 72% of the data falls in there. Remember, it was approximately 68%. So it's actually 72. Well, what if we jumped out to two standard deviations above the mean? We expect it to be 95. It's actually 92. So for real data, this isn't perfect. It's just a ballpark. It's just a back of the envelope approximation. It's not always exactly that because real data. And then finally, 99% of the data, 99.7 is what it's supposed to be. So we have a very small amount that's not in that range because of these people down here who claim they sleep four hours a night. So practice question for you. One of the following is false. Number one, the majority of the Z scores in a right skew distribution will be negative. In a skew distribution, the Z score might be different than zero. For a normal distribution, the IQR is less than two standard deviations. Or Z scores are helpful for determining how unusual a data point is compared to the rest of the data. Well, number four is correct. So it's not that. So of the three remaining, which one will be false? Number one, right skew. What do you think? Let's sketch a right skewed distribution. So right skew means it's pulled to the right, which means it's shaped like that. And the mean is pulled with it. 
So the mean of the distribution is there. Where is the median in this case? Do you remember this from the skew? Is the median to the left or to the right of the mean under a skew? It's to the left. The median is where the median is. It doesn't get pulled, but this skew pulls the mean up. So we have 50% over there, 50% over here. And remember how Z scores work. You take the number minus the mean, then you divide by the standard deviation, which means all of this over here will give negative Z scores. So are the majority of Z scores under a skew right distribution negative? Yes, majority meaning greater than 50%. It's not one. In a skewed distribution, the Z score of the mean might be different than zero. Is this possible? What happens if I take the mean and I put it into the Z score equation? I take the mean minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. The Z score of the mean is always zero. So in a skewed distribution, the Z score of the mean might be different than zero. That is false. The Z score of the mean is always zero. No matter what, doesn't matter what skew you have, it's always zero. And that's just wrong. <laughs> I'll fix that in my slides, repost it. All right, I'm going to show you how to do a couple of these things now in our studio. All right? And this is what you need for the assignment this week. And I wanted to give you a little bit of a, a guide as to how to go about doing these problems. So let me just switch away from these slides and into R, and I'll show you how to answer the, this particular made-up problem. All right, what do we have? I have a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of, one, of 15. That's true for all of these four problems. I will post this little file that I'm working on right after the lecture, so you can just grab it if you don't have your computer with you. Don't, don't worry about that. I'll make sure this is up on Blackboard and Slack as soon as I get back to my office. So question one was, the probability that x was less than 115. So that is a curve, normal. 115 is our cutoff. We want the area to the left of it. So I compute p norm of 115, where the mean is mean and the SD is SD. What this does is exactly the same as if I type them out. Mean was 100, SD was 15. Both of those are identical. So let me run them. I, I think I mistyped that. One sec. Okay. There we go. 84%. And if I run it, with the specification, it's exactly the same number. So the probability of x being less than 115 is exactly 84134474. You can copy that number and paste it into the box on web work for a problem like this, and it will work perfectly. Don't try and round it. Don't try and be sophisticated. Just compute the thing you think it is and paste it in. Question two. We wanted 85 to 115. All right, so this one's a bit trickier. What are we doing here? We want the area that is smaller than 115 down, but we don't want the stuff that's 85 down. 
So we're going to take a difference, and we're going to do P norm of 115, mean is mean, SD is SD. That gets us the area from 115 down that we already computed, minus the bit from 85 to 0. That's 68%. What was our approximation for plus or minus the standard deviation? 68%. What's the standard deviation here? 15. So it is indeed 68% of the area in a perfectly done normal distribution. Question three. We want it greater than 130. So again, we want something now on the upper tail. So to compute this guy, we need to take away from 1. Because we can compute 130, but that's not the answer we actually want. That's the area from 130 on down. We want the area of 130 up. So 1 minus this is the answer. And it's 2.27%. 0 0.0227. Finally, 145, exactly the same thing. 145, mean is mean, SD is SD. That is less than 0 0.1, sorry, it is 0 0.13 of a percent. Very, very small. Does anyone know what these numbers actually are? Anybody ever seen these numbers used in a, in a natural real world context before? No, I mean specifically like mean of 100, standard deviation of 15, these 115, 130, et cetera, numbers. Has anybody ever seen it used before? This is the standardization scale for IQ testing. Properly done, psychologist run IQ testing, not those Facebook quizzes that tell you that you are a super, super genius Einstein or whatever they say. Properly done IQ tests for the population have a mean of 100, a standard deviation of 15, which means, what is this? That is how many people in the population have an IQ of at least 145. The answer is less than 0.2 of a percent. How many of you either knew or were uh, in the gifted program in primary and high school. You know of it, you know that it exists, there was somebody you knew, maybe yourself, you were in it. The cutoff for that was 2%. You needed to be the 98th percentile or higher in the Ontario system, for those of you from Ontario, to be placed in the gifted program. That's how it's set up. Let's figure out what that would be in terms of an IQ score. Ninety-eighth percentile of this distribution. Q norm of what? Zero point ninety-eight is the area to the left. One hundred and thirty point eight. So anybody placed in the gifted program received on a standardized, properly done IQ scale an IQ of about one hundred and thirty-one or higher which just sort of reminds you of the fact, if you do a survey of students, you're like, what's your IQ? And you have some vague memory of having taken a Facebook quiz at some point, and you recruit. They're all bogus. 50% of the population has an IQ below 100. And even more, lower than 115. 130 is the cutoff for 98% of the population. And there have been several people in history done proper scores where their IQs were above 180. What would they be? So one minus this, a very, very small number. One in hundreds of millions. So it's a very, very small percent. But there's only been three or four people in recorded history that I, I use scores that high. 
So back in the slides, that answered all of these. This is the last problem I want to show you, and this is the trickiest problem on the assignment, so pay attention to how I solve this, okay? What if we are told the 30th percentile is 10 and the 75th percentile is 19? What is the distribution then? So, 30th percentile is 10 and 75, 75th percentile is 19. What are mu and sigma? That's the question. All right. What data do I have? I have that 10 is the original X score that corresponds to an area to the left of 0 0.30. So this tells me that 10 has a Z score of negative 0 0.524405. Because I took Q norm of 0.3 and I said, hey, if I had an area to the left of 0.3, what Z would that be? And it gave it back to me. And then I take the 75th and I do the same thing. So Q norm of 19, sorry, of 75, 0 0.75 for the percentile, which means 19 has a Z score of 0 0.3. 6744898. So I now have two Z scores. And I have two X's. What I don't have are mu and sigma. So let me flip back. So I have a Z score of negative 0 0.5, what was it? 5244 is the Z score for 10 minus mu divided by sigma. And the other number that I got was 6745, which was 19 minus mu over sigma. That's what those two Q norms just allowed me to do, is they gave me the Zs that go along with that 10 and that 19. And now I need to find mu and sigma. So this is where you need to think back to year 11 math. What do I do in this situation? You've done this before. In grade 11 or grade 12, when you did math, you've solved something like this before. What do I do to isolate and solve? Substitute. I isolate in one, substitute into the other. And so what you would do is you take one of them, and it really doesn't matter which one. So this one tells us, that 10 minus mu is equal to negative 0 0.524, I'm out of space. <laughs> yeah, run off the edge of the page. Negative 0 0.5244 sigma. And then you need to isolate one of the variables still. So that means I get mu, I bring it over to this side, and I bring the 5244 to the other side. Mu is 10 plus. 0 0.5244 sigma. Now that I've done that from the first equation, I take this result here and I plunk it in and replace that mu and solve. Did everyone understand what I just did? I know it's been a while for some of you. You haven't taken math maybe in a couple of years. This is about as sophisticated as it gets in this course. Being able to solve two equations in two unknowns by doing isolate, substitute, solve. But you do need to be able to handle up to this level. So you need to be able to isolate, cross multiply, and solve. Any questions? All right. I'm going to solve this in my office and I'll post it in the slides. Give it a try yourself as practice just to have one where you know the answer. There's one question on the assignment just like this. We're finishing early. Have a good day.